So, well, thanks. Uh, it's nice to give a layperson the last word uh, after all of this. And I, Ray asked me to speak on the subject, what a layperson as I am, uh, what we expect or want, or I would prefer to say need from our pastors. Um, and it's kind of difficult to be put in this situation because I don't think lay people should be critics of our pastor or you know reviewers of the sermons or the like. Uh, but I was asked to do this. Uh, I'm grateful for the pastors I've had. I was counting them up. I think I've only had about five that were really my pastors. And my newest one is here, uh, Pastor Douthway. I just transferred to his church at St. Athanasius, was sent a contingent of 10 uh, people driving seven hours. I've been doing this every year, uh, far before I've, I've come. Um, so anyway, I really appreciate the pastors. I, I love our, our new pastor here. Appreciate that. So uh, I'm going to say some things based on you know, my own experience with pastors, and I've known a lot more pastors, and I've known a lot of other lay people with pastors, so I'll offer this just for, for what it's worth, and I hope it's helpful, and I hope I don't step on anybody's uh, toes, especially our, our, our pastors who are here. Um, I was involved with... Uh, group of families who were going to start a mission congregation. Um, and so we were gathering together and the district had sent us people to, so we worked through what we were looking for in a pastor. And we went through all these exercises, what skills do we think do we want and what attributes do we think our congregation needs and all this and we're going through it and one of the members just was getting kind of sick of it and said, we just want a pastor. Okay. We just want a pastor. And, and that's a good thing to keep in mind because there are a lot of other models of ministry, as I think they're called, that have the pastor not really being a pastor. Uh, I was on President Barry's uh, task force to study the church growth movement. And so we were studying all of this, reading all this material, and we invited uh, some pastors who were involved with this and interviewed them to learn about what they were uh, trying to do. And one of the pastors was of a big, big church, and he said, uh, I don't do hospital calls. He said, I haven't done an evangelism call for you know seven years or whatever it was. My people do that. I've got all of the congregation organized so that the lay people do all of the calling, whether it's the hospital or evangelism calls and so on. And my job is to uh, train them and supervise them and make sure that they do it. Um, he also said, we haven't had a, a voters meeting for, for seven years. That may sound kind of good to some of you pastors. Uh, actually, I think this pastor was a follower of, of David Scare. He had a very high view of the pastoral ministry. And, uh, but the, the model he had is very different from, from uh, uh, Dr. Scare. Uh, he said, I see myself as the CEO of, of, of a business. The church is the business. I'm the CEO. I make all the decisions. It's all my responsibility. I don't need voters to tell me what to do. Um, the members are my employees. Okay, That was how he thought of the pastoral office. He's the CEO. The members are his employees. He makes sure that the employees do the work of the church, such as hospital calls, evangelism calls, everything else. Yeah, notice what's happening with that. He has lay people doing what he was called to do, people who have no calling necessarily or any knowledge of what necessary to say to in the hospital call to somebody who's dying. He probably has real CEOs of actual companies doing that. 
While as he is doing really what uh, Pastor Scare pointed out, Article 28 of Dr. Greenfield says not to, he, earthly rule. Okay, so in his model, he, he's all about ruling the church like somebody who runs a business. And so the vocations are all twisted, they're, they're all out of whack. He has people doing what pastors are called to do, and, and he's doing what maybe lay people are called to do, namely be CEOs and administrators and all of that. Yeah, but we have pastors to be pastors, not CEOs, not psychologists, which is another common model of ministry over the last few years, a psychologist, someone who can you know, help you with your problems, with your emotional problems. Uh, not a motivational speaker, which is another common uh, model here, and just turn on the TV and you can see lots of examples of that. But we, we need a pastor, we lay people do. I think we need pastors to understand the doctrine of vocation, to understand their calling. What is that? Well, the word pastor simply comes from the Latin word for shepherd. And again, Baptists talk about ministers and Episcopalians have their priests and, and there are many terms for this, but Lutherans have always used that term pastor, which means shepherd. And the idea is that somehow the pastor is someone who is a shepherd. We lay people are his sheep and the pastor is someone who takes care of his sheep, who leads the sheep, where they need to go, who protects them from danger, and who feeds the sheep. And of course, ultimately the calling of the pastor is to feed his sheep. That's what our Lord told uh, uh, St. Peter, feed my sheep. And the pastor is someone who feeds us with the word, God's own word, and with Christ's own sacraments. That's the pastor's vocation. That's the pastor's calling. And I'm, I'm going to get into some more of what that implies, at least from a layperson point of view. You know, what, what does it mean to have a shepherd? Uh, what, what do we need from our shepherds? Um, I would say it also would be helpful for pastors to understand uh, lay people's vocations and callings. Um, when I first became a Lutheran uh, a number of years ago, I loved the church so much. And I got so involved. And I was at church sometimes every night of the week, seven nights a week. I threw myself into everything. I was on committees. I was on evangelism calling groups. I was on uh, Bible. I was going to Bible studies. I was going to men's club things. And I was really involved. And I even, uh, well, at one point, one pastor said, "But well, you're you're a uh, you're a writer. You like to write, so uh, let's put. Uh, would you write for our uh, church newsletter?" Okay. So, so that was another thing that, that I took would take on. And I realized I was getting so busy with church that I was neglecting my kids. For one thing, that was back when they were very young. I was neglecting my marriage for another thing, and I was neglecting my work. And that as I was writing the, those deadlines for the church newsletter, I, I had other obligations in my professional writing that uh, that was competing with. And this is a little before I discovered the, gospel, the doctrine of vocation, but I realized even then that God had called me, I had vocations as a father and as a husband and as a, as a worker. 
and that sometimes church work can actually compete with those callings that God gives us as lay people. Uh, one of my observations, and again, I don't want any pastors to take this the wrong way, that a lot of churches are way too busy. Okay, there's way too much going on. And it's, it's good, and, and we do have a calling in the church, and we lay people do need to be active in the programming of the church. But it's helpful for pastors to realize that, and, and for us lay people, who are I think, to blame for a lot of this, we often assume the kind of the Roman Catholic view that, which has also become the main view of American evangelicalism, that only church work is serving the Lord. Whereas Luther taught in the doctrine of vocation that we live out our Christian faith in our different callings. We live out our faith in our marriages. We live out our faith in our parenthood. We live out our faith as citizens, the calling we have in our, in our country, in our culture. We live out our faith in, in the workplace, whatever it is. And Luther emphasized, it, it, it's not even a matter of doing church kind of things out in our vocation. In other words, it's not just serving God if you are evangelizing on the job. Just the very act of, of your job, whether it's working on a factory line or working in a business or whatever you're doing, that alone is loving and serving your neighbor through your work, and that is where you live out your Christian life. And so the model that Luther gives of the Christian week or the Christian life is that we're out you know, in, in, in the world. We're out in our callings. And then we come together in the divine service where we find the forgiveness for the sins that we do in, in our calling. The Catechism talks about which sins could we confess. Luther says, consider your station in life. Consider your calling. Um, whether you're a, a, a mother or a father or a worker or all of the rest. We, we fail in those callings and we sin, so we come back where we are forgiven where we hear God's word, where we're built up in our faith. And then we go out into our callings, into our vocations, to live out the fruits of that faith. And then the next week we come back and then we go out. And, and, and we grow and, and God works through our callings and, and God builds us up in, through the special calling that the pastor has where in the stead and by the command of his Lord Jesus Christ, he forgives us, for he teaches us and proclaims that word, and so on. Um, pastors sometimes forget that they too have other callings. If the churches weren't... Okay, I was complaining because I was at the church every day of the week. Of course, pastors usually are at the church every night of the week, and sometimes they can neglect their marriages and their parenthood and their obligation into the community and so on. And those are callings that pastors have too because vocations are multiple. I would just say that if churches were not so busy, both the lay people would have a proper understanding of living out their faith in their, in their callings and pastors wouldn't be so overworked and so stressed out as sometimes they get and so busy that everybody would probably be, be happier. But we need pastors to understand their calling. We need pastors to understand our callings. Um, we, we also need, we lay people need to know our pastors and to be known by our pastors. Uh, New Testament, talking about shepherds and sheep, talks about how, speaking of, of, of our Lord, the good shepherd, who, who, are, who our pastors uh, work for, um, you know, talked about the uh, shepherd knows his sheep, and the sheep know their shepherd's voice. Sometimes... Um, this doesn't happen as it should in a congregation. Um, 
we we joined uh, one to members of a very very big big congregation, and several thousand members, and it was a conservative congregation, and uh, but we were there and we joined. And we uh, invited our pastor to to dinner so that we could get to know him, and the pastor said, "No, I don't do that. I don't socialize with with my members because the congregation is just too big." And I can't show favorites, and I can't, you know, we don't want to have clicks. And so he was sort of, maybe you were taught this in seminary, I don't know, sort of at arm's length from your parishioners. Um, and again, that was, that was sad to us, because we didn't need to know our, our pastor. But I think more importantly, maybe the pastor needs to know the sheep, needs to know us. Um, just as I think a lot of churches are too busy, I think a lot of churches are too big. And I know I want to gr make, grow the church and make it big, but when the pastor doesn't know the individuals in the congregation, I don't know how he can be the kind of shepherd that at least we lay people, we sheep need. Um, how can you know, you know, 3,000 people? Um, our pastor is a very fine pastor, and we did, there are times in our family, needed pastoral care, and I really, we were really blessed by the care that we received. But most of the 3,000 people, I know he didn't even know their names. And some lay people like that, because, in fact, that's one of the attractions of big churches, because you could be anonymous, ironically, when there are, you know, thousands of people uh, uh, with you in all these different services, and you don't really have to get to know an, the, the, the people, even who's in one service or the other. But it seems to me that Again, the old rule that the, the optimal size of a congregation is how many that the pastor can know. When the congregation gets so big that the, con the pastor doesn't know all the members of his people, it's time for that congregation to split into two and then let them build and, and, and grow and then split some more. And that's one good way of having more churches. I think that's the way it used to be. It'd be interesting to return to that. But again, we need to know our pastors. And more importantly, we need to be known by our pastor so that our pastor knows us and what we need and so that he can be there to, to minister to us. Um, another thing we need, we lay people, we need for our pastor to be gentle and, and patient with us. Um, there was a pastoral care situation that I was privy to in which the pastor was absolutely right in what he was saying. And the parishioner was absolutely wrong. But the pastor was so harsh in the way that he dealt with it that it didn't really bring the parishioner around. It, it didn't even seem that that was the the purpose that he was even trying to. He made his point, totally accurate in what he said, but he handled it so harshly that the parishioner was devastated and then became defensive, you know, throwing up all of the, the guards against what he was doing, and it was very nearly driven away. Whereas I really... I'm confident about that if he had been just a little more gentle with dealing with this person, a little more patient, I'm convinced he would have won that parishioner over. Okay. Again, we need our pastor to be to be gentle and patient with us. Now, this this kind of sense of harshness is sometimes thought to be a problem with some of our more conservative pastors who make their stand and, uh, and you know, it doesn't matter what the other people say, and, and sometimes that happens. But I found there's even more of that kind of cold, I've never seen the cold-blooded harshness like I've seen in, um, in, in, in pastors of a more, um, more liberal train. Um, 
And that mission church that I mentioned that we were involved in, we talked to a number of pastors, some that we were considering calling, and I realize now that we shouldn't be interviewing and things like that, but again, we didn't know any better. But, but one of the pastors that we talked to had a reputation for going into a, a mission situation and then growing it into a really big church. And he would do that, have success, then go to another one and build it up and go to another and build it up. So we were considering calling him to our situation. Um, but he was explaining his approach. He said, in order to, to grow a church, as he called it, he said, one of the things you have to do is uh, choose who to lose. Choose who to lose. He said, you'll find somebody in your congregation that will be against what you're trying to do. Usually it's the ones that oppose change. And they are become obstacles to changing the church so that it's more popular and will bring people in. And one of the things a pastor has to do, it's a very hard decision, is choose who to lose. And I thought, what a, what a way to consider members of your flock, that some of them you're going to drive away so that you can maybe attract some more people. But, but that struck me as, as a kind of a cold-blooded ruthlessness that I think was unworthy of a pastoral spirit. Are you taught that in seminary, uh, choose who to lose? Uh, uh, maybe not at Fort Wayne. Um, but again, that's apparently, and I've heard that other places, that's in some of the church growth literature that pastors read who want to, you know, get these big mega churches. Choose who to lose. Um, yeah. Uh, ironically, in that situation, we, we finally did call a, uh, a, a pastor right out of seminary. It was called for us. Um, and he was a, a fine young man, fine young pastor. He went to a district workshop, though, where he was taught about these church growth methods. And as he was wanting to throw out the liturgy, you know, bring in the, the drums for the contemporary Christian music, you know, I w for, for example, I would kind of question that. And I would, um, you know, argue for a different course and, and make a point that we didn't want to give up our Lutheranism. And to make a long story short, we were chosen to, you know, we, he, he chose to lose us. We were chosen to lose. In fact, within a year, every one of the founding families were driven out by this young pastor. And it wasn't that he excommunicated us. Part of the problem is our own desire to be obedient lay people. That can sometimes work against us. The, the confessional lay people, we, want, we hold our pastors in such high esteem that we don't like to be in conflict with them. We don't like to disagree with the pastor. And when the pastor you know, does something that you know, goes against, it's, it's hard for us to, to confront a pastor or to even disagree. And when we do disagree and do talk to him, it's very, very painful. But anyway, the way we were, we the way it got to be, uh, we were um, again. He, we you know, choose who to lose. He he, cho he chose us as well as the other founding members who called him to begin with. Uh, now the church has grown, and now it's very contemporary. Has no trace of liturgy, very little Lutheran uh, theology, from what I've heard. But uh, it's grown. I don't know if it's quite grown where he doesn't know everyone. But that kind of impersonality sort of, I think, thrives in that same kind of context. But that was one of the most traumatic things that we've gone through and as, as, as Christians. What was, uh, um, was that experience? We need to be able also to trust our pastor's leading. We need to be able to trust our pastor's. Trust that he's leading us in the right direction. Um, I talked to a woman from another congregation 
whose church had gone through something similar. This this was a very very large congregation too, but but she, she talked to me and she started, she was in tears just about. She said, "I don't know my own church anymore." I mean, they had gone totally contemporary worship, gotten rid of all the hymns, gotten rid of the liturgy, um, become like every generic evangelical church in the area. But she said, but pastor said, we should make all these changes. So I went along with it because I know the pastor and I want to respect the authority of the pastor. But now... And she said, I don't know my own church anymore. And that was sad. Now, I know there are cases, and some of you pastors being a very different perspective, I know those where the lay people demand changes, where the lay people demand to adopt contemporary worship or whatever it is. And there's some very sad cases where they've driven out, you know, good, confessional, faithful pastors who are standing on the Word of God in our confessions. And they, they've driven him out. And they, you know, fired him from, basically, uh, despite his, his, his divine call. And that's, that's a terrible thing. But there are also cases... And I might argue they may be even more numerous where the pastor demands that the congregation make these changes. And how they drive out good confessional lay people who want to be remain Lutheran. Now, who writes the books advocating all of these changes. Who, who writes the church growth manuals? Uh, pastors in most cases, not laymen. And I think one of the dynamics in our, in, our, in our church body is that many of our Lutheran laymen are so obedient to their pastors, like this woman, that they let them get away with murder. Okay, murder of our worship, murder of our confessions. That's not the norm. That's not what what is supposed to happen. We lay people, we confessional Lutheran lay people, we do want to be obedient. We do respect your authority. But we need our pastors to be trustworthy so that we can follow them, and we want to follow them. But we need to realize that they're not going to lead us astray. Okay, we need pastors to proclaim God's Word. Not their Word, but God's Word. Uh, I've attended a Lutheran service. It was a, a Christmas service. It, well, it was, I guess, an Advent service. Uh, but it was just a couple Sundays before Christmas. And so the, the sermon was about how to avoid stress at Christmas time. And the sermon was all about, you know, get enough sleep, uh, uh, you know, get organized, you know, watch your shopping pattern, and all this very good advice, which is well and good. It didn't even mention why we were celebrating Christmas. It didn't even mention the Christ child. It didn't even mention Christ. There was no gospel. There was not even law. It was just therapy. We lay people don't need that. We can get that from uh, all kinds of sources. We can get that from magazines. We can get that from watching the Dr. Phil on TV. We don't need that from our pastor. Again, we want our pastor to be a pastor. Um, and so in preaching... Um, Again, keep in mind what we uh, we heard from uh, uh, heard just now. We need the law and the gospel. We need the preaching of God's word. Uh, I've heard sermons that were hilarious. 
they were just so funny that I just really had a good time listening to them. I've heard sermons that were dramatic. It was like, like going to a play, these dramatic readings of uh, some exciting story. Uh, I've heard sermons that were very moving in many ways. Uh, I've heard sermons that were touching personal testimonies about the pastor's personal life. But I don't want that in a sermon. I want the Word of God. The best sermons, the, the sermons that have the most impact on my life are those that unpack God's Word so that it, it comes clear to me, that explore the depths and riches of God's Word, that apply the text of Scripture to my, to my life. It's God's Word that has the power, and, and it's, that, that's what I need from a pastor. Again, there are different ways of doing that. I love uh, expository sermons, ones that just take a scripture and just plunge us into it. But the other way of, of taking the theme of that scripture and driving it home, uh, those are fabulous. Again, my new pastor, Pastor Dalthway, is one of the best biblical preachers that I've, I've heard. I come away from some of the sermon just astounded just by... God's word and and how he he has he makes it um, uh, applied to my life. But again, you, you pastors stick to God's word, proclaim that, bring the law and the gospel to us. We need pastors to lead us to heaven. And that's the biggest need we have for pastors. We sheep are prone to wonder. We need a pastor to keep us going to where the good pastors are and bring us to everlasting life. The idea that we lay people, that we people in the pew, need the gospel is something that I think a lot of church growth material kind of forgets. It's frustrating for us lay people, uh, active and involved in the church, to, to hear that our church should be all about non-Christians. That what we do should be geared to non-Christians, so that non-Christians will like to come here more. And that what we may want or need has nothing to do with it. That the church exists for non-Christians. Now, I certainly believe in evangelism, and non-Christians do need to hear the gospel. But in the words of a classic piece by Rod Rosenblatt, uh, Lutheran pastor at, uh, and, and professor at, at Irvine, um, it, it is a great presentation that the gospel is for Christians too. And, and I think a lot of us, including Lutherans, have adopted the Baptist theology that the gospel is just for conversion. Now, conversion is for the first time you come to believe. Okay, and of course the Baptists have no, despite their name, have no belief in baptism really. But the idea, and I've heard students, uh, evangelical students talk this way, that yeah, well, right, I believe that Christ died for sinners. And when I was 12 years old and accepted Christ, that came to me. But now, we're under the law. Okay, the gospel is for back then. Whereas one of the great things that I discovered about Lutheranism when I became a Lutheran is that we need the gospel every moment of our life, and we have the gospel. We re receive Christ not just back when we were 12 years old, but I mean, every time we come to the Lord's Supper, we literally receive Christ for our forgiveness and our salvation. And every time we confess our sins, and the pastor gives us absolution, we're given that forgiveness 
all over again. And so the, the whole life of the Christian is one of being evangelized. Right? We lay people, we faithful members of your congregations need to always be evangelized. Okay? And the fact is, and of course, well, the other part of the Baptist theology is that you, um, um, become converted to the gospel. You don't really need the gospel anymore. But you're also, um, you know, once you're saved, you're always saved. And they leave out the reality that sometimes we can fall away. And I think sometimes even we Lutherans or our you know, the people who run uh, some of the some of the workshops and some of the uh, pastoral ch church growth uh, um, programs want us to try to get conversions and and, and think that that's the the business of the church. The business of the church is is to lead lead us into heaven, and those of us who are in the church need that care because we too often doubt and struggle and sin and you know Walter's point that at any given time there are people in the congregation who have, have lost that faith that's a reality and even for those of us in the pew, faithfully coming there, there, there are times we may well be in a desperate spiritual situation. And we need to be cared for. We need that gospel. And the people in the church already need your care need your evangelism as much as even people who are outside the church presently. Again, we, we want to reach them, but reach the people in front of you. We pass, we lay people need pastors to lead us to heaven. And that means that when we face trials and problems and crises in our life. We want to, we, we need the pastor to be there for us, to build up our faith, assure us of, to bring Christ to us, and to help get us through that. Right? Um, there are moments in life that are times of crisis. There, there can be good crises as well as bad crises. But it's interesting in the, the sort of the rhythms of the Christian life, the key things that happen, uh, the birth of a child, you know, a joyous thing. Again, that, that's a good crisis. But, but when, when you have a child, you know, your life is changing for the pastor to be there and to uh, visit you. And of course, then to baptize that child, that's a great thing. Thing. And, and the pastor's presence there is so precious. So we lay people just so thankful of that. And of course, marriage uh, would be another one. Probably should put those in the different order, shouldn't I? Uh, marriage and then the uh, child marry. But, but times when we have a problem, or especially when we face death, that's when we really need to be built up in our faith and prepared to meet our maker. And that preparation comes from a deeper dependence on, on Christ. So that's why in the hospital, we appreciate so much you calling on us. And even when we're in the hospital for little things, having our tonsils out, something that maybe isn't life-threatening, when you're in the hospital bed, you think about death and you think about uh, what could happen. And again, when the pastor is there to give us that assurance again, that's so precious to us. Um, and then when we really are facing death, you know, when we're old or, or sick, that, that's, that's more priceless than we can even say. And when a loved one dies, 
It's a crisis. Again, the, the past, you're just present. And it, it's not just what you say. Um, the new Lutheran service book, one of the great things, it, it has a pastoral care thing where it gives pastors things to say and words to use in prayer when you're dealing with things like suicide or uh, visiting the sick or visiting somebody who's been a tr victim of some tragedy. Because I know that's hard to come into that, to minister, not knowing what to say that. Maybe that's some resources that you can use. But for those of us being served, it almost doesn't matter what you, you say. Your presence reminds us of, of, of Christ's presence and your willingness to uh, pray with us, to be there for us, uh, to just give us that God's word of assurance is, is, is priceless. Those routine things that you do um, when you maybe rather be working on your sermon or talking about theology on the internet or whatever. Just so for the rest of lay people, though, those are so, so precious. And they may not always say that, but we really appreciate them. Again, we need pastors to lead us to, to heaven. Um, George Herbert was uh, arguably the greatest Christian poet. Uh, he lived in the 1600s, um, and, and he was a um, um, he was a parish pastor. He was of a noble family, but he chose to minister to a little church with about 50 people in it. Uh, I visited that a few weeks ago. There was a George Herbert conference that I uh, was asked to speak to. And, and it just a tiny little church. It's still an active congregation in England. Um, but he wrote a, a poem that I think does a lot to sort of get the sense of what the, the pastoral office is all about and what we lay people really get from our pastors. It, he said, Lord, how can man preach thy eternal word? Now, Herbert struggled a lot with his vocation and what he was supposed to do as a pastor. And here's that question, Lord, how can a, can a human being preach the word of God? Lord, how can man preach thy eternal word? He is a brittle, crazy glass. He said the, the, the preacher, he feels this way. He's, he's, he's just a, a brittle piece of glass, brittle crazy. That meant uh, cracked originally. Our word crazy is a metaphor from that. So I feel like I'm just a, a cracked piece of glass. How can I preach God's word? He said, yet in thy temple thou dost him afford this glorious and transcendent place to be a window through thy grace. The pastor is a window. And in this poem, he, 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 he develops the, the image of the pastor as a stained glass window. It's a window on which the life of Christ is inscribed. So you think of a stained glass window showing Christ on the cross. In fact, that was the window in Herbert's church. At the back of the stained glass window of Christ on the cross. He said, that's what it is to be a preacher. Of himself, he's just a brittle piece of glass. And when you look at stained glass windows, you know, it's, it's lead, it's, it's drab, it's dark. There's nothing to it. But when the light shines through it, the light is glorious and dazzling. Right. And Herbert said that's what the preacher is. Of himself, he's, 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 he's an ordinary man. Maybe, maybe he's brittle. <laughs> maybe he's crazy. But he's a window. He's translucent. Through the pastor, through his preaching, the grace of God is shining. And the pastor's job is to be at least translucent, <laughs> to, to preach in such a way that it's the Word of God, that it's God's light that shines through that text. 
He's preaching Christ so that Christ comes through in his ministry. And again, it doesn't depend on how great the pastor is of himself necessarily, uh, though know, pastors here are, are certainly great in your way. But for, for us lay people, it's, it's the light of Christ that we want. And on the pastor's side, again, it's Christ who's forgiving us and the pastor absolves us. It's Christ, as Dr. Uh, um, Foran said, who, who, who baptizes through the hands of the pastor. It's Christ who gives us his body and blood through the hands of the pastor. And the pastor is that window, that stained glass window that shines th through which God's grace is shines. So um, that's what we need. That's what we lay people need. Um, am I right? I'm asking my fellow lay people in, in attendance. <laughs> okay, amen. <laughs> Thank you very much, Dr. Veith. Uh, questions or comments from the panel? Uh, Dr. Veith, uh, as a layman, do you want a specific ministry pastor, as it's been outlined for us and was adopted at convention? Well, one of the things you may be surprised to hear from lay people, including uh, me, is that we're not even up on all of the things that are going on in Synod and synodical politics and the things that, um, so I, I really have not known a lot about that until fairly recently and I don't know all the details even even yet. Um, so again, a lot of these things we're, we're oblivious to. Um, so yeah, I, I would just say, I, I don't know enough about it to venture an opinion. And you'll find that a lot of your lay people are that, are that way. <laughs> Pastor Yes, uh, thank you for the encouragement to do what we've been taught to do and uh, ordained to do. Uh, if, if you could find a place in uh, western North Carolina, you come down my way, be one of my parishioners, that'd be great. <laughs> no, I'm kind of high maintenance. Uh, you, may not, you may not want me, as Pastor Dalthwaite may, may find out. <laughs> well, the blessing is, is his and yours. Uh, from him. Uh, I guess what I'm wondering is, uh, as uh, pastors, when we, uh, we have to point out things that uh, false teachers teach. Yes. And we sometimes have to mention other denominations, and I notice you're not you don't mind doing that yourself. You spoke of Baptists and different. But we can get ourselves in a lot of hot water with our people over the years when we do that. And I guess I'm wondering if it's just how we do it mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, or whether... We, and, and I was wondering with uh, Dr. Verkencher whether uh, Walther ever got himself into hot water with his parishioners or whether... Or, or everyone were just supposed to be like Dr. Scare and not care. Maybe that. <laughs> Well, I, I don't know that, uh, that that you would necessarily have to get in hot water. Uh, usually, I think we like our pastors to take strong stands, don't we? And, and sometimes we like to know that we're in the right church. And uh, the way I do it, though, there is a way to do it that comes across as very harsh, and there's a way that does it in, in, in a gentle way. Um, in my book, Spirituality of the Cross, it's sort of an experiment in communicating our faith to people today. And one thing I did is when I criticize other people and other beliefs and religions and denominations, I turned it upon myself. Because there was a time when I was in evangelical circles, and I still am, I suppose, in, in the circles. But instead of criticizing somebody out there, I found a way to criticize myself and what I used to believe. Now, you obviously can't do that uh, in the time, you know, if you criticize the Masons when you're not a Mason. 
But, but there, there are ways you can express that criticism so that it is, comes across as very constructive. And, and then when you have to really lambast, lambast someone like a sinner, um, again, you've got to do that. But when you, just as a, as a matter of uh, a rhetorical technique, if you can sort of aim it at yourself first, and then your parishioners will, will pick that up and they see that you're a person like they are and they can, they can trust you. Um, so as far as criticizing other, other beliefs, um, I don't know. It, it's true that people today don't tend to be relativists in our culture. And one of the things you've got to do is teach your parishioners, teach us lay people not to be relativists. But it's true they will often come to church that way. And when they hear a constant diet of how this group is wrong, that person is wrong, that person is wrong, they can sort of uh, find that disconcerting. And um, you can teach them about relativism and, and help them recognize that in their lives so they'll change. Um, but sometimes if you put it, not just that you're, you're condemning them, but you're preaching the gospel. In other words, see, I'm doing all this at my new, at my new job at Patrick Henry College where most of the people are students and others are evangelicals. Lutheranism is so helpful in so many ways, including to people like that who are still under the bondage of the law. And when I just tell the regular Lutheranism, no, you need the gospel and you can have the gospel right now. They hear that and they're liberated. When they hear the, God, the doctrine of vocation, they're liberated. In other words, you don't have to necessarily tear someone else down in a, in a harsh and angry way when you're lifting up such a, a, a sweeter and more winsome alternative. So, again, that, that's just how I would, I would say. We in the Methodist Church appreciate your sensitivity. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Just quickly so we can finish up. When you talked about we need a pastor who's a shepherd. The shepherd feeds, but he also protects. Mm -hmm. yeah, you know, absolutely. David, he fought the lion, he did that and the other. Absolutely. Part of the protection is what is Second Corinthians said is of a steward is to be faithful. And so as a pastor, to be faithful to God's word, and that's to protect us from false teaching. Absolutely. The uh, in another comment, will you agree with that? And then our lifestyle is really a proclamation. We're, we're not all ministers in the sense, we're not ordained, we're, we're, but still the way we live, the way we do things. We, that, and I remember getting advice from a CTCR man, pastor, he said that it was a charismatic situation. And he said, well, tell the truth, but be winsome. Mm -hmm. I think you just mentioned that name. Uh, we have a, a former pastor. He, he retired and moved down to Florida in, in what they call a Lutheran Haven. Anyway, much younger wife. He died about two years ago. Now she wants to come back. She said, that congregation is so big. She met a new lady and said, what's your name? The lady said, 412. I said, what do you mean? Well, that's my envelope number. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, that the Baptists, they, they've, they've got a saying, what makes them a Baptist is not that they all have immersion, but that they all believe that they're free to do their own selection of mm -hmm. what God's word means to them. Mm -hmm. And one of it is, is so you believe so prove it. Mm -hmm. Right. Well, we need to. <laughs> yeah, I was saying that. But again, we do need to be protected, and there's so much out there that we need to be protected from. And I would suggest to pastors that one of the things that would be helpful now is that you 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 know are become well read and notice what's happening in the culture and in the theological landscape uh, because your lay people are being exposed to these things and you may not even be aware that they're even out there. Um, uh, on television, the the the, the most past uh, popular minister is uh, Joel Osteen. 
I, I, I don't see any evidence that what he's saying is in any way Christian. And yet I guarantee your, your people are watching that and are being influenced by it and may even come back to you and wonder why you're not more like him. But it's all, you know, you create your own reality. It's more Hinduism, the prosperity gospel, that if you believe enough, you will become uh, wealthy. Is that what you're speaking about in this book? Well, I'm speaking against it, yes. Well, I'm not advocating it, yes. That book teaches about vocation, which is very helpful. Again, to teach your people, because they don't necessarily know that what they're doing in their everyday lives is their calling from God. And it is a it is a it is a holy thing. Um, so, yeah, the pastor's job is a very big one now, and and the shepherd needs to protect against the wolves and the lions. And believe me, they are they're out there. But um, again, you Christ can use you to you know, lead us beside the still waters and restore our souls. Questions or comments from the uh, audience? I believe Dr. Foyer. Yes. Uh, I really appreciate very much what Dr. Vieth has said today. I would like for all of my students at St. Louis to have heard that. And maybe we'll get the opportunity for that someday. But uh, the two things I wanted to mention. One is the Pauline thing that Dr. Pieper mentions in volume one of his dogmatics about the hobby twist, that there are two tasks that a pastor has. One is to positively proclaim the gospel and the good work, but the other is to refute, mm -hmm. refute those who are in error. That's one of the things we're no longer permitted to do as it were, as pastors. We're no longer permitted to refute or rebuke somebody's falsehood. It's their falsehood and you leave alone kind of attitude or something like that. But we must take this on. But the thing is that when we do that, we must do it in love. Mm -hmm. That's one of the problems with the yeah. confessional or the conservative Lutherans say is the fact mm -hmm. that we often do it with such a, an edge to our voice. That's right. And, and I would say if a, a parishioner knows that you love them, you can tell them just about anything. And, and they will not you know, react negatively. I mean, you still may have to work with them, but if they have the sense that you really love them, you'd be surprised what you can get away with. The other thing comes to the fact that the, God will provide the pastor sometimes to ask for forgiveness. I think that's one of the things that we, mm -hmm. we need to be aware of, the fact that uh, if um, we find ourselves in error, that we've done something wrong, they go to the church and we ask forgiveness for that. Mm. That's a very blessed thing that we're able to do and receive his forgiveness and their forgiveness then. And that would be a very a positive thing. Yes. Mm -hmm. That's a good point. You know, we, we think about being a, an example, and pastors are certainly an example to their flock. But sometimes I, I think the examples we try to be, even when we come across as so righteous and good and perfect, we think that's what attracts people. Sometimes that drives people away. Uh, I, I've been in the case where uh, my wife was instrumental in helping uh, one of her friends become a, a Christian. And later she talked about how, uh, how, how she influenced her. And he said, the, the way that Jackie helped me come to faith is I'd always thought Christians were so perfect that I could never aspire to that. But hey, Jackie's no better than I am. <laughs> in a way, being able to confess that we're sinners and for a pastor to be able to come that he's a sinner and to ask forgiveness. I mean, that's, that's a kind of an example that really counts right? To be broken before God's law and to be dependent on the gospel of Christ. That is a very powerful communication, I know. Other comments from the audience? I, somebody over here, I think, had their hand up. Yes, sir. I don't speak to serve me, but forgive me. For you think I'm part of the doing things of me. There are some offenses in the story. I think of Jesus yeah. in the temple. He got kind of mad. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And, and we need that, too. We, we like people, we need that. 
and uh, something we need to be uh, uh, kicked and <laughs> driven out of the, the marketplace. Um, and yeah, I didn't. Uh, I, we, we need that, but but that too, I think, can be done out of out of love. And, and some people do need to be cast out. Okay, not because they, uh, you know, for trivial kinds of reasons, um, but certainly, and and ex how to exercise that kind of discipline is something that, again, as a lay person, I'm not sure that even I, I can speak to how how that needs to be done. That's what you. That's part of your pa you pastor's calling, but. Uh, Right, we, we we sometimes need harsh treatment, or, or we need hard treatment, and um, but again, even that can be done to the end of of, of restoration.